Okay, so we'll just sing a song that we usually sing before class. So those of you who know it could um, sing along. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja So this evening we are reading from the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Tyler, do you, oh excuse me, I'm calling you Tyler. Uh, <laughs> Alex, do you think you could close that door too, please? So we're reading from Bhagavad Gita, um, as it is, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So the reason um, there's many Bhagavad Gitas, I don't know how many Bhagavad Gitas there are now. They probably have that written somewhere, but I don't know, hundreds, hundreds, 600? Okay. So there's like 600 Bhagavad Gitas, maybe more. Um, so Bhagavad Gita, Gita song, Bhagavad song of God, song of Krishna. Um, and the reason why the reason why Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, entitled this Bhagavad Gita as Bhagavad Gita as it is, is because in the, in the introduction he explains that, oh, recently somebody has, has asked me um, to recommend a particular Bhagavad Gita, to recommend a Bhagavad Gita to them. And he said, I, I couldn't find one. <laughs> Practically he said this, that I couldn't find one that was authorized. Which means that, as it is, means he didn't add anything into the Bhagavad Gita and he didn't subtract anything based on his own personal uh, preferences or uh, whims. So therefore, as it is. So we're reading from Bhagavad Gita as it is and we'll be reading from um, chapter two, contents of the Gita summarized 
and we'll be reading from text 66. So if everybody could please uh, repeat after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, so this is um, chapter 2, text 66. Nasti buddhir ayuktasya nacha yuktasya bhavana nacha bhavyavata shantir shantasya kutasukam One who is not connected with the Supreme in Krishna consciousness can have neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind without which there is no possibility of peace and how can there be any happiness without peace uh, purport unless one is in Krishna consciousness there is no possibility of peace so it is confirmed in the fifth chapter 529 that when one understands that Krishna is the only enjoyer of all the good results of sacrifice and penance, and that he is the proprietor of all universal manifestations, and that he is the real friend of all living entities, then only can one have real peace. Therefore, if one is not in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be a final goal for the mind. Disturbance is due to want of an ultimate goal. And when one is certain that Krishna is the enjoyer, proprietor, and friend of everyone and everything, then one can, with a steady mind, bring about peace. Therefore, one who is engaged without a relationship with Krishna is certainly always in distress and is without peace. However much he may make a show of peace and spiritual advancement in life, Krishna consciousness is a self-manifested peaceful condition which can be achieved only in relationship with Krishna. Om Ijnana Tibhidandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshulan Maditam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha I was born in the darkness of ignorance and my spiritual master opened my eyes which, with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisances unto him. So the very um, the very basic uh, the very basis of all of our everyone in this room and everyone in the world of all of our activities is um, based on certain convictions we have about life. There's certain convictions we have. In other words, there's certain things we have faith in, or there's certain things that we believe. And based on these beliefs or based on these convictions, we move in certain directions or we move, we don't move in certain directions. Like for example, some people think that, have conviction and faith that, oh, by going to Las Vegas, I will enjoy. <laughs> um, I'll gamble and this and that and I'll enjoy, right? Um, Whereas some people, they don't have faith in that. They don't have conviction in that. Um, like myself. <laughs> um, I, uh, I went to Las Vegas recently, to the temple. Um, I gave a class there, Sunday, Sunday talk there. And um, yeah, so my, my, many people go to Las Vegas and, you know, some people would think I'm absolutely insane for going to Las Vegas and simply going to the temple. I went to the temple, and then I went to somebody's home. They, they, we had breakfast on my way back to San Diego. And then, um, yeah, that's it. I didn't even go on the main street. <laughs> Can't believe it. Um, so people think, oh, this person's crazy. You know, why? But it's just a matter of different perceptions. It's a matter of um, w 
at, at one point I, I I will go back and we'll go on the main street and we'll um with drum Hare Krishna with drums and cymbals we'll we'll do some chanting so that's what we'll go there for but um but that's just one example there's so many examples of of different things different uh, we have faith in different processes of happiness right so this is what's going on in the world it's a it's a place it's a realm where there's uh, a lot of people and so many of those people there are, are promising so many different things right oh do this read this book read that book right listen to this podcast this and that I have all the answers here how to make you peaceful, how to make how to make you happy, right? Um, so, similarly, Krishna, in some way similarly, Krishna is saying here that, th this is Krishna's opinion, he's saying that uh, one who's not connected with the Supreme, one who's not connected with Krishna himself, um, in Krishna consciousness, can have neither transcendental intelligence. In other words, the intelligence cannot be spiritual, right? nor a steady mind without which there's no possibility of peace so in other words um, what's being stated what's being stated here by Krishna is that is that we have to of course we could do whatever we like but Krishna's opinion I'm just repeating here is that we have to um, become connected with Krishna and then there is a chance or and then what will happen is that our mind, uh, we ha we'll have transcendental intelligence and we'll have a steady mind. So in other words, our mind will not be um, unnecessarily disturbed. Now wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> to not have a disturbed mind. It would be very nice. I mean, the World Health Organization, who... Who has who has been very um, active this last year and a half? They um, have uh, decided that um, through their investigations and so on, statistics that a huge problem in the world now is mental problems. It means mental diseases, diseases of the mind, meaning being disturbed and so many different things like that which it is a problem. Um, so here Krishna is giving us a spiritual way how to solve this problem, and that is to become connected to him through Krishna consciousness. Uh, without, there's no, without, with, and without doing this, there's no peace. And then he, and do you think he closed that door, Glenn? And then he's saying that without peace, um, how can there be any happiness? And how can there be any happiness without peace? Hey, Glenn, can you take, can you close this one too? Sorry, I'm asking, I'm, I'm stuck on this seat. <laughs> Can't move around so much, I'm kind of stuck here. Um, asking everybody to close doors and bring tables and we have some partiers next door, so just trying to, their music is going and I'm not trying to focus on their music, I'm trying to focus on talking with all of you, so. Um, it's distracting my mind a little bit. So, uh, so yes, we need to have a steady mind, an uh, undisturbed mind, in order to have peace, and without peace, how can there be any happiness? So, so here, Krishna, he is giving his opinion, he is given his formula for happiness, and that is to engage in Krishna consciousness, the act, the activities of Krishna consciousness. Which first and foremost, yeah, first and foremost is the chanting of Hare Krishna, which we were just doing earlier. Um, this is the main process for this age that we're in, um, according to Vedic uh, authorities or spiritual authorities in this this tradition. Um, and it will work uh, provided we, we, we engage in it. If we don't engage in it, then, yeah, I mean, how can we expect it to work, right? 
but if we engage in it, it will work. And what are some of the what are some of the um, what are some of the ways in which it, it works? Well, the chanting of Hare Krishna it it uh, frees us of having a having a disturbed mind, right? Mantra man means mind, and tra means to free. So mantra is what frees our minds. So it will free us, our minds. And it will, um, will um, transform us. So to engage in the activities of Krishna consciousness, this is... Uh, and a lot of times people, they doubt this actually. It's common. I mean, we doubt things, right? Um... But if we're doubting it on any level, then we could, we could challenge, right? We, we could challenge it. In other words, the statements are not meant to be like armchair statement, armchair philosophy statements, or, oh, that kind of sounds cool, or that sounds boring, or whatever. But the statements, we could see them as uh, statements of a, a personal, cha it's a personal challenge. So Krishna is personally challenging us here. You could see it like that. We could see it like that. And then it becomes more interactive. It becomes more um, alive. That, hey, I'm being challenged here. And the challenge is that you practice Krishna consciousness or we practice Krishna consciousness and see the transformation. That's the challenge. And... Uh, devotees or of Krishna, bhakti yoga practitioners, following Krishna's challenging mood, <laughs> they may also challenge us. Like one time there was a devotee uh, by the name of Tamal Krishna Goswami, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, and they opened a temple in Fiji. And there was an Indian man next door who was living there, and he was really disturbed by the Hare Krishnas, you know, making so much noise and hitting the drums and at 4.30 4 in the morning and things like that. So he was disturbed. So then uh, he was talking to Tamal Krishna Goswami, this Indian man, and he was saying, I want you guys to leave. I want you to close the temple and I want you to leave. You know, although you just got here, I want you to leave. So... Um, Tamal Krishna Goswami, he said, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, let, let's make a deal here. He said, you chant Hare Krishna for 30 days. And if you do not see a positive transformation in the realm of happiness, if you don't feel yourself more happy in life, then, I'll, then I'll, I'm the main leader here. He was. I'll close the temple and we'll pack up our things and we'll leave. This is a pretty big challenge, actually. I mean, I mean, imagine somebody, you know, our, our neighbors, right? They come over here. I want you guys to leave. And we say, all right, well, we challenge you, you know, 30-day challenge, chant Hare Krishna, or else we'll leave. And he was serious about it. So so the man, he, he in Fiji, the Indian man, he, 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 he accepted that challenge. He chanted Hare Krishna for 30 days. And then he came back, and he said, all right, I had a, positive transformation, spiritual transformation, I'm more happy. And it so happened that this man, Indian man, he, he became a disciple, a student of Tamal Krishna Goswami, like a formal student. And he's actually still around. He's the temple president in uh, Dallas, temp, uh, Hare Krishna Temple. He's like the main, one of the main leaders there. So, so many years. So, Similarly, we could see it as a challenge that, that Krishna is saying this is the formula for, formula for happiness. So let's challenge it. Is it really true? Um, uh, so in the, in, the, in the challenges that we enter into the, you could say, the, the laboratory of, of bhakti or the laboratory of Krishna consciousness, we challenge the statements. Um, so that's a little thing we can meditate on. Uh, and it's a point Prabhupada mentions in the purport. If one's not in Krishna consciousness, there, there cannot be a final goal for the mind. So the mind becomes peaceful, or we become happy, 
when we have a goal in mind. And then someone will say, well, I have so many goals in mind. Um, which Srila Prabhupada is referring to as a spiritual goal, which is another important aspect in life is that we have so many goals, right? I want to make so much money. Maybe we're saying that. I want to buy such and such very expensive car or not so expensive car. I want to be more thrifty with my money. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes these big, these guys in like big corporations, although they have like practically, maybe in some, well, I don't know about literally all the money in the world, but they got a good amount of it. Sometimes they make it a point to like you know, shop at Walmart or <laughs> wear, you know, the same pair of pants for like, you know, five years when people with the amount of money they have, you know, they could wear whatever, $10,000 pants. I don't know if, if they make $10,000 pants, but probably somewhere. They make, they make very expensive purses. I know that for whatever reason, purses are coming to my mind. Of course, I'm not attracted to purses, but personally. What's the most expensive purse? What? 100,000? No, more than that, right? I don't know. Does anybody have any idea? No ideas? Anyways, all right. Doesn't matter that much, apparently. You're all spiritual, right? <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 somebody told me that in some, some restaurant, I think in Los Angeles, it was like, it was some, I don't know what they were serving there, there but it's like very expensive to have lunch, like, like, like ridiculous amount. I don't know. They said something, I don't know if it was $10,000 for lunch or $20,000, something just like insane, just for one lunch, you know, for one person. And then, and then I was thinking to myself, they're paying so much to have this particular type of food, you know, whatever it may be. Probably in the meat, there's some meat category there, I would think, you know. And then I was thinking to myself, they're paying to have that. And I was thinking, you couldn't pay me <laughs> to, to eat at these restaurants, you know, because they're just serving, God knows what they're serving, you know, some kind of. Um, so, so anyways, yeah, we may have, people have somebody go, oh, I want to get this very expensive thing, or I want to, I want a house in, in Hollywood, and I want a house in Paris, and I want a mansion here and there, or this, we have so many desires, but anyone who just analytically studies the matter, and we're not even talking spiritually here, we're not even talking like, you know, metaphysical or spiritual, you know, per se, just logically, or, yeah, analytically studies, um, they'll see that the world and the people of the world, they're, they're, there's a lot of opulence, actually, a lot of material opulence, a lot of material facilities. Srila Prabhupada, he studied the matter very carefully, our spiritual teacher here, and he said that he would come to America and he saw... Um, just as based on his experiences talking with people and, and, and observing people, he said, there's a lot of people, he said the Americans, he said the Americans were good people, you know, good hearted and everything, but he said there was a lot of an unhappiness there, people's happiness, right? Or why in America, if people have so much facility, why is there, or is de there's a decrease in happiness? Because it means that the goals are just not not um, not exactly where it is. Like Prabhupada would mention about this about about peace or about but, but about opulence, for example. He said in America, somebody was asking him. Now Prabhupada, of course, this is July Fourth, so we're not we're not bashing America here. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. You know, Prabhupada, he, he the first place he came to was America. By the way, <laughs> now he came to America, New York City. Um, but he uh, he commented, he said, because people were talking about, oh, there's so much opulence in America, right? material opulence. And then Srila Prabhupada said, oh, what's their opulence? He said, they don't even have one moment's peace of mind. So this is the real opulence, to have peace of mind. That's real opulence. Like one, do, one person that 
that I know of, friend. He said, I'm not actually sure where he got this from, but he says real wealth can be measured by how many things you have that money can't buy. <laughs> right? So real wealth is measured by how many things you have that money can't buy. So peace, I mean, at least from the perspective of Christian consciousness, can't be bought, right? Even freedom, right? Like real freedom, freedom, uh, spiritual freedom, it can't be purchased with money. Um, friendship, love, right? Sleep. Yeah, these yeah, a peaceful sleep. Yeah, I mean, people take all types of medicines and to go to sleep and somebody gave me some said of course this is more natural, I guess. The body produces itself. What is it called? Melatonin. It's, it's pretty intense actually. <laughs> so cuz kind of struggling the next day, you know. Um to kind of like But uh Actually, when I was in Las Vegas, <laughs> they gave me melatonin to go to sleep, you know. So, so the next morning, I was kind of... Um, but yeah, it, it, it's not so easy, you know, spiritual freedom, peace, just to go and buy it. Now, someone may argue, well, that would be nice, right? you just like, all right, I want some spiritual freedom, you know, let me go buy it in the form of a pill, right? Let me go to local CVS and buy some pill piece, uh, peace pills, right? Or whatever types of pills, um, but uh, but unfortunately, or I don't say unfortunately, but but the reality is that it's not it's not so easy in that sense. But it is easy. In another sense, is that we just have to apply ourselves. That's all. It's it's not difficult. It's not complicated. It's very easy and very uncomplicated. We just apply ourselves to spiritual technology to spiritual practices, spiritual, spiritual process, and it will, um, it will work. Um, and then some last points here is that is that therefore one who is engaged without a relationship with Krishna is certainly always in distress and is without peace however much he may make a show of peace and spiritual advancement in life. So, um, so, so the distress that one feels in this world, um, it can be mitigated. It can be transcended by Krishna consciousness. It can be uh, completely transcended. The, the, the distress one feels. And um, Prabhupada saying here, Srila Prabhupada saying here that those who do not have Krishna consciousness, they're always in distress. Now some would say, hey, well, that sounds kind of that sounds kind of um, kind of black and white, you know. Oh, they're always in distress just because they don't have Krishna consciousness. Now, it's a matter of uh, conviction, but it's also a matter of realization. Uh, we are eternal souls, spiritual beings, right? And the nature of the soul is eternality, it's eternal, and it's full of bliss and full of knowledge. So, so the idea is that if we're able to reconnect with Krishna, we will feel that uh, bliss, we'll feel that happiness, and we'll experience that knowledge. So in relation to that, in re the, the eternal bliss one feels, the knowledge one experiences, right? And being in sync with reality or in being in sync with one's spiritual identity, in relation to the happiness we, f we feel in this world, it is practically distress or mitigation of suffering. Happiness is 
the mitigation of suffering. For example, um, in other words, it's based on suffering. Like, for example, you fast for a day, right? Or two days. Or three days. I don't know. How long can you fast? Seven days? You fast, right? You're getting hungry. It's undeniable. The urge to have something to eat. You know, you really want to have some... Because you're fasting. So, it's a bit of a suffering condition, actually. And if you don't believe it's suffering, just keep on fasting. <laughs> You realize it's suffering, right? But then what happens is that then you you take some food, right? But what is that? Okay, it's nourishing to the body. It's, you know, pleasing, right? In terms of the smell and the taste and everything. But it is mitigation of the suffering of hunger. That's what it is. It's based on suffering, actually. Mitigation of suffering. And so much of the happiness in the world is like that. It's based, first, there's the suffering and mitigation. Now, um, now, of course, that may just be part, that's just part of this world. But, but what, about, what about there being a whole other realm of spiritual happiness, which is not just based on suffering and mitigation, suffering, mitigation, suffering, mitigation, but, there, but it's just based on the soul's reawakening of their, of their spiritual identity. And that's what Bhagavad Gita is saying, that the happiness that we can experience is beyond all this, you know, suffering, enjoyment, mitigation, all this business. It's transcendental, beyond the body, beyond the mind. And, um, and therefore Krishna is urging us over and over and over again in the Bhagavad Gita and the followers of Krishna are urging us over and over and over again to at least, at the very least, give it a, um, give it a, uh, a chance. Give it a chance. In other words, uh, do not, they're advising, do not um, relinquish the idea of Krishna consciousness before giving it a chance. Give it a chance, practice, and then if you don't like it, then <laughs> relinquish. Um, then, then, you know, reject it. So, um, so yeah, in conclusion, Krishna is saying here that if we, uh, if we're c if one, if we become connected to Krishna and Krishna consciousness, we can, we can have transcendental intelligence and then we could have a steady mind and then um, we could be peaceful and then uh, happy. So we start off with the spiritual practices and then work our way up through steadying our intelligence, um, through steadying our mind, you know, and then um, becoming peaceful and then happy. So, all right, does anybody have any uh, questions or comments about anything? Yes, Mr. Glenn. So next Sunday, by the way, we're going to be having a little ceremony here. You are all welcome to that ceremony. And in that ceremony, Bhakta Glenn, who is about to ask the question, and Bhakta Alex, who's sitting in front here, these two young men here will be, um, there's a ceremony and they'll be putting on uh, this color, <laughs> saffron color. They're both wearing white now, but they'll be wearing saffron next Sunday. So Bhajanarayan Swami is scheduled to give a talk about the importance of what does that mean, you know, to wear saffron, and um, it's, which is a sign of renunciation, it's a sign of monkhood or taking it seriously, student life and all, the, all that goes along with student life, spiritual student life. Um, so yeah, it'll be a nice ceremony. They'll come to the ceremony in their cl white clothes here. And then part of the ceremony is that Bhajanarayan Swami will give them a new set of orange saffron clothes. And then they'll run upstairs and <laughs> change into their orange clothes and their lives will be transformed. <laughs> it's so easy, right? When I first put on saffron, I didn't have a big ceremony like this. I actually, what happened is I was staying in the temple for some months 
and then I was getting ready, getting ready in the morning to come down to stairs, 4.30, our little program here we have every morning. And uh, I, I, I ran out of clothes, actually. I ran out of, like, my white, you know, sets of, you know, kurtas and dhotis, robes. So then one of the monks who was wearing saffron at the time, he said, well, uh, maybe you should just put on saffron, you know. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, maybe, I, maybe I will, and I just put it on. <laughs> And I came downstairs, you know, and uh, Bhajan Ryan Swami is there, there, those of you who know him, he said, oh, well, you look good, you know, <laughs> that was my ceremony, <laughs> <laughs> look good in saffron, and then I've been wearing it ever since, so that was like, I don't know, more than 10 years, you know, four, fif- 14 years now, you know, but, um, but this is more, you know, leaves an impression on the person's mind. It's better, you know, spiritual impressions. And then also for others, it's, it's uplifting for the community and, you know, what's going on here. And so, um, and but the main point of bringing that up is that I was thinking, oh, I put on saffron and then, you know, I'll be transformed. And, you know, it's like, well. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there was something there, obviously, some transformation, but to the degree I was hoping for, you know, didn't take place. <laughs> just by changing the cloth. Prabhupada makes that point, you know, if to be a saintly person doesn't just mean changing the cloth, but, you know, if you change the consciousness. So, so anyways, I was wor- I've been working, trying to work on my consciousness ever since. <laughs> so, all right. Sorry for that. Glenn, you have your question now, <laughs> now, now that I've thoroughly embarrassed you? Thank you for the class, Bono. Thank um, you. Earlier you mentioned about the most expensive purse. And yes. I, I looked it up. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> you guys ready? Yes. Seven million price tag. Really? Yeah. For a for a purse. Ah, it's because it's made shocked. out of a it's made out of a some type of alligator skin, in the H- Himalayas. Oh, man. And it's made out of an alligator skin. I can't believe it. Such an expensive purse, seven million dollars, just because made of an alligator skin. It's almost like something. Of course, how talented people were in the past, who knows? Of course, we have some ideas. You know, hundreds of years ago, whatever. There's some ideas, but you know, they they were they've been hunting crocodiles for a long time. You know, and I would think some of them at some point in the past made purses too. (laughs) You know, I don't think they sell them for seven million (laughs) dollars. They probably just, you know, made a purse and you know, give it to their wife or their daughter or whoever, you know. Oh, that's amazing. Huh? Yeah, if they return from hunting the alligator, yeah, sometimes it's a little, you know. Yeah, that happens sometimes. You know, these people, they're out in the nature. Uh, they're out in nature, you know, dealing with different animals. You know, there's attacks, so. All right, thank you for that valuable information. I'll keep that in mind. For for if I bring this up in a f- in a future talk, seven million dollar. I think we should look up what's the most expensive lunch. What's the most expensive restaurant with the most expensive lunch? But yes. So Suresh is asking, when is the ceremony after the Sunday? Oh, so yeah, the ceremony is next Sunday, which is July 11th, and we didn't do it on July 4th because there's a lot of traffic here a lot of people so it's probably easier people to visit july 11th due to all the parking spots and stuff somehow all of you (laughs) manage that um but it'll be july 11th and 5 30 to 6 30 we'll have the the normal kirtan we have and then 6 30 to 7 15 bajanarayan swami will give the talk give a give a talk on whatever he's going to speak on in relation to this and then at 7 15 he'll I think Dravidar Prabhu also, our other senior monk, they'll hand the new sets of dyed cloth to you, and yeah. And then after that, in August 1st, on August 1st, there'll be another ceremony, these two also. (laughs) And also some others, there's Mike, Bhakta Mike, Alex, Glenn, who else? Huh? Ujeshri, I think. Anyways, a few others. The ceremony will be initiation ceremony, which is a ceremony um, that a uh, a guru, a teacher, spiritual teacher, um, formally accepts students 
where, um, you know, the guru chants on the beads. Like Srila Prabhupada, he chanted on, he initiated so many disciples. One of them here, we have Pavamana Prabhu. Here you can raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, Pavamana Prabhu, he was initiated by Srila Prabhupada, which means Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada here, he chanted on, you know, his beads, his meditation beads, gave him to Pavamana Prabhu, gave him the spiritual name Pavamana. So that will be happening with Alex and Glenn here and others that they'll be um, getting a spiritual name and, uh, you know, the guru have give him a new set of beads that he's chanted on. Oh, yeah, Ed. Ed. So Bhakta Glenn and Ed will be initiated by Bhajanarayan Swami, our local GBC and guru. Um, which is, it's, it's a historic event because... Um, He's been a member of this temple for like 40 years, maybe longer, 45 years or something. And Bhajanarayan Swami. And also, he, um, this will be his first disciples, actually, Glenn and Ed. So, you know, because there's many gurus in the world now. And, you know, they have 800 disciples, 1,000 disciples, and, you know, 10,000, however many disciples they have. But to be like the first, you know, it's so it's, um, so yeah, it's a special event. So if you can make it next uh, or August first, um, and Alex also won't be budging around somebody, Bhakti Vikash Swami, and and others from different gurus. But so it'll be fun, spiritual fun. Um, anyways, does anybody have any other last? Uh, there'll also be a big special prasadam feast cooked. For the for that initiation as well, does anybody else have any um, any other uh, questions or comments? You want to request something for the initiation feast? You want us to cook something special? <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, we well we have some. Um, Prasadam, some dinner packed in uh, boxes out there on the patio. So if you like, you could take a box um, with you. You could also take more because I think we've, we weren't, you know, we were expecting a little more people. So we, there's a lot of extra. So you could take like a box for your brother or your sister or your uncles or aunts or whoever you could think of. Take some boxes for the homeless people around the corner or what do you, what's the, more uh, classy way of saying homeless people. Um, anyways, you take them for whoever, you know, many boxes because we've got quite a few. So, what were we going to say, Glenn? Last? I was just going to mention that we have a lot of prasad. So, bring three, ten. Prakash said they made enough for like to last the whole week. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so we have those. So if you like, you could take them to go with you. That's what we've generally been doing. Or you could, you could stay on the patio too if you like. So, All right. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.